This morning, U.S. Senator John Cornyn, just back from Poland and Germany. Also taking our questions on tomorrow's vote for Judge Kentonji Brown Jackson. And as COVID subsides, why Cornyn is urging President Biden to keep one specific pandemic-related law. There's one city in Texas taking unused doses of the COVID vaccine and putting them in the arms of Mexicans. State Rep. Richard Raymond explains why that is now necessary. At one point, he was among the most powerful politicians at Dallas City Hall. Dwayne Carraway, now out of federal prison, plots a comeback in his first TV interview. And Attorney General Ken Paxton using state money to defend his own law license. But is this a state or personal matter? Something we'll talk about on the roundtable. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to our viewers across the state. As we begin April, let's also begin with some of the top political headlines here in Texas. The question right now, will Russian hackers try to take down the Texas power grid because of what is happening in Ukraine? They have already been poking around in computer networks of utility companies and energy companies. That's according to the Texas Tribune. Major oil and gas transportation networks in Texas and across the country right now are on high alert. The Pentagon is reducing the number of F-35 fighter jets it wants next year. These are one of the most advanced weapons the U.S. has, and they are made in Fort Worth. The Pentagon was projected to purchase 94 of the F-35s next year, but the Pentagon has now pared that back to 61. Texas Democrats and Republicans are asking the administration to reconsider. And news out of College Station, Texas A&M is offering free tuition to its students from Ukraine. This is up to $25,000 to cover tuition, school fees, and some living expenses. Texas A&M also said it's already broken all ties with Russia, including some research contracts that have now been terminated. Let's begin, though, with that vote tomorrow in the U.S. Senate. Democrats have the support to get Kentanji Brown Jackson out of the Judiciary Committee on Monday. And within days, it looks like they will also confirm her as the first black woman to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. Texas's two senators, though, are not in support of her nomination. It is where we begin with the state's senior senator this morning, John Cornyn, who just returned from Poland and Germany. Senator Cornyn, welcome back to the program. When the Senate Judiciary Com uh, Committee meets on Monday on whether to send Judge Kentanji Brown Jackson's uh, nomination to the full Senate, you said that you would vote no. Tell us why. Well, the judge is a very charming person and certainly has an impressive resume and uh, broad experience. But the role of the Supreme Court justice is, is very different because you're the final word on a lot of the most controversial issues that uh, face our country. And frankly, I couldn't get a good answer from her on whether she understood the difference between my job, which is to make policy, and her job, which is to interpret the law not uh, make new judge-made law. And so, uh, because I think that was kind of a blind spot and, and something I didn't have confidence in, uh, I'm a no vote. When she was nominated in February, there was something that came out in a press release I wanted to ask you about. You said, no matter what, Judge Jackson will be given the dignity and respect she deserves. The American people will see a starkly different process from the treatment of Justice Kavanaugh and other judicial nominees during the previous administration. Now with the hearings behind us, do you think that uh, Judge Jackson got the dignity and respect she deserved? Well, I've been here for eight Supreme Court vacancies, and I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think certainly compared to some of the worst extremes and worst treatment, like the Brett Kavanaugh hearing, uh, Judge Jackson's uh, confirmation hearing did not compare. Look, I think the judge, she's an experienced lawyer and judge, and she's used to answering tough questions. Um, just because some of the members of the committee were offended or didn't like the line of questioning, for example, the sentencing practices uh, for child pornographers, uh, I thought the judge was capable of answering those questions and uh, certainly did not think the questions were out of bounds. If you can't ask the judge about her own record, I don't know what you can ask about. Senator, let's talk about Title 42 for a moment here. That's the law that Presidents Trump and Biden have both used to 
to let them expel migrants from the southern border. Obviously, it's pandemic related. It's uh, being used to protect the country from COVID-19. Since the virus is subsiding now, as you know, President Biden wants to end Title 42 and allow people to uh, come across the border. If there is no public health emergency, why not end this? Because I know you sent a letter to President Biden urging him to keep it in place. Well, if there's no public health emergency, I don't know why you and I are required to wear masks on public transportation, including airplanes. So there seems to be conflicting messages out there. But certainly, um, it is it is on the uh, it is subsiding. Uh, but you have to understand, people coming across the border are not vaccinated. They're not even tested for COVID nineteen, and we know there could well be other variants. But here's the basic problem: this is one of the only tools available to the Border Patrol to expel people entering the country illegally on an expedited basis. The Border the uh, Border Patrol tells me if they don't have this tool in the absence of any other change like uh, uh, enforcement measure, uh, they will lose control of the border. And last year alone, there were two million border encounters. This year so far, there have been a million. And so my conclusion is that the president and his administration simply don't care about the border and they don't care about enforcing the current law, including against uh, the drug smugglers who smuggled in drugs that killed 100,000 Americans last year alone. So this is a very serious matter. What we're asking for is a transition plan or a plan B. If they're not going to do Title 42, what are you going to do to try to control the border and keep uh, people out who are, are not entitled to be here? You are just back from a trip to Poland and Germany here recently. Is there anything else you think the U.S. should be doing to bring the fighting in Ukraine to an end? Well, we need to do more and we need to do it faster, whether it's uh, humanitarian aid. There's a genuine humanitarian crisis. There are huge numbers of displaced persons and, uh, and refugees who visited one of those refugee centers in Poland. And then the, but this, but the Ukraine, Ukrainians are doing incredibly well defending themselves, but they need the weapons uh, to do that with. And we need to get them more of those that they can use faster. Um, I think uh, this has not gone well for the Russians, but unfortunately time is on Putin's side because he can use long range weapons from Russia and not even expose his airplanes and his people to uh, uh, anti-aircraft or other defensive weapons and uh, level Ukrainian cities and kill innocent civilians. So we got to continue to help the Ukrainians any way we can. And fortunately, uh, one, one of the silver linings of this, maybe one of the few, is that uh, the, the world now knows what uh, the Putin's character is like. And uh, he's unified uh, NATO and Europe as uh, no one else could. One last question here. There is a report that the Texas power grid faces potential cyber attacks from Russian hackers. Are you satisfied with the security in place to keep us protected in Texas? I, I think this is a, um, a work in progress. Um, cyber attacks are a part of the daily life of, uh, of, of private American industries and businesses, as well as, uh, as well as the government. So unfortunately, cyber attacks are part of our daily life now. And we have to continue to up our game. We're not where we need to be. We're, we're trying, uh, but there's uh, more we need to do. Senator Cornyn, thank you for the time. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, let's get some more context on what is happening tomorrow in D.C. The U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee on Monday will take a vote on Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson there. They're going to decide whether to send her nomination to the full Senate. Democrats have the votes to get her there, and now it appears they have the votes to confirm Judge Jackson as the country's first black woman to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a story that Abby Livingston has been living and breathing for the past few days. She is the D.C. Bureau Chief for the Texas Tribune. Abby, good to see you again. Uh, Judge Jackson has the, uh, a lengthier resume than the last three Republican nominees to be uh, nominated to the U.S. Supreme Court. Is there another reason why Ted Cruz and, and 48 other Republicans do not think she is qualified? Well, they have arguments against it, and it's rooted in judicial philosophy. And I think many of 
Texas viewers saw the hearings and saw the questioning from both Cruz and Cornyn as their members of the Judiciary Committee. But I think the reality of this is this is how Supreme Court nominations are going to go from now on. Uh, it's how it's been the last few years, but they are going to be partisan votes with a few sway votes either way. Um, but this is this is this has been escalating for 30 to 40 years, and this is where we are. Yeah, I think it is a new norm. Quickly, though, I want to ask you: Is there any chance that Republicans have of stopping her confirmation later this week? I highly doubt it. Now, we saw Brett Kavanaugh's nomination get thrown into chaos, so never say never, but right. at this point, there it seems to be smooth sailing. All right, Abby, back to you in a moment. Thank you very much. Coming up, one Texas city is taking unused doses of the COVID vaccine and putting them in the arms of Mexicans. State Rep Richard Raymond explains why that is now necessary. And at one point, he was among the most powerful politicians at Dallas City Hall. Dwayne Carraway, now out of federal prison, is plotting a comeback in his first TV interview with us. And two of the smartest minds in politics are on Yolitics this week. Mike Madrid, the founder of the Lincoln Project, and Chuck Rocha, the senior strategist for Bernie Sanders' last two campaigns. There are two episodes of Yolitics this week. This one is raw, it's funny, it's insightful, and it's in the weeds about how Latinos might save the U.S. democracy. You can download it this weekend wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. Surplus doses of the COVID vaccine end up in the trash. But for months, Laredo has rescued them from all over the state and uses those vaccines to vaccinate Mexicans right across the river from Texas. This is a story the Texas Tribune first reported a few days ago and one we wanted to know more about. State Rep Richard Raymond was an early proponent of it, a Democrat from Laredo who we tracked down on a trip to Boston. Representative Raymond, welcome to our program here. This has been going on since June. It's set to run out at the end of the month. Do you expect it will be renewed? I don't know. I mean, you know, what we what happened in Laredo, I can only speak to Laredo, to be honest, is that, you know, uh, our health authority director, uh, Dr. Victor Trevino, who's a wonderful guy, he's been he has a, he's had a family practice for many, many years, and I have worked with him on many issues through the years. Uh, it just occurred to him at one point that uh, there were different pharmacies and cities around the, the state that were throwing away vaccines because they expire, as you know. Right. At some point, uh, Dr. Trevino just started calling around and said, hey, you guys, uh, do you have vaccines that are about to expire you're going to throw away? And they said yes. And so he just asked if they sent them to him, and he just decided to, to reach out again. We work very closely with the, with the municipalities. Uh, the Laredo, city of Laredo and the city of Nova Laredo have worked on issues through the years. And, and that's where he got the idea that trying to do something that would help the city of Laredo, the people in Laredo, because you have so many, as I said, so many people coming over back and forth every day. Well, and so that's how it started. What kind of difference has this made in Nuevo Laredo and in Laredo? Because Laredo was one of the, the, the most vaccinated cities in the entire state. And now right. the people across the river are getting vaccinated. What kind of what kind of difference and impact has it made with hospitals, with communities, et cetera? Absolutely. What we've seen is that the the as, as that program started, then you started seeing fewer people end up in the uh, intensive care unit mm -hmm. and fewer cases. Well, the trajectory, I think, started going uh, slower instead of going up as rapidly as it had gone. I, I can tell you're getting a lot of uh, messages come through your phone there. Last question for you. The, yeah. the state is supportive of this effort here, but as with anything COVID related, there is controversy and skepticism, et cetera. Have you heard any regarding this effort? No, I, I haven't up to now. Uh, I, I just haven't. Um, it just hasn't come up. Uh, so I, I can't tell you there is controversy. I, I guess I haven't read about it yet, or yeah. certainly nobody's called me, and it's not popping up a lot in Laredo, or at least not that I can see it. I, and I just went through a campaign. This never came up during the campaign. All right. Sounds good. Representative, we appreciate it. Good luck to you on this effort as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dwayne Carraway spent more than a decade as one of the most powerful men at Dallas City Hall. He even served as the 60th mayor of Dallas, but his political career came crashing down when he pleaded guilty to federal corruption charges. Carraway just finished his prison sentence and told me in a special episode of Yolitics that there is still a lot more that he wants to get done. Here's a short clip from it. You're really in a unique position 
to advise the public, to advise City Hall, to advise anybody else who's listening, what are the red flags that citizens and that voters should be looking out for if another Dwayne Carraway or another Don Hill happens at City Hall? If wrongdoing is in the City Hall, right. you only need the council persons, the representative, the elected officials vote to pass it, okay? Now, if you are a developer, the city council, for example, takes the recommendation of who? The city staff, city okay. manager right. staff. Yeah. City manager staff. Yeah. City manager staff. Yeah. City manager staff, okay? So now, if the recommendation is the most important thing to get to the elected official, and the majority of the elected officials are going to do and take the recommendation of the city staff. Right. Who does the developer go to first? I would presume the staff, city yeah. manager staff. Yeah. But then that's what y'all yeah. need to start looking at then. You just answer John. Always? Well, that's, well, that's, that's, that's my just, question. I'm just, I'm just saying that's where you need to look at. The recommendations that are done, Yeah. okay? If you want to clean it up, I just gave you the inroad, okay? Do you, uh, uh, you know, that, that's what you have to take a look at. Was there corruption happening in city I, manager's I, I, office? I, 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 I can't. You asking me all these different questions, and I'm gonna stop answering these when I talk about something else. But because I've dubbed in it as, uh, uh, as much as I'm really wanting right. to. But here's the deal: uh, I don't know about all those different things. I will put a lot of this stuff in my book. Okay, uh, circles of deception. That's what it's going to be. That's what we're writing. And then you'll probably learn a little bit more because I'll be a little bit more freely to talk about those things. You can be free right here, Dwayne, well, if you want to on y'all ticks, man. Well, I'm, 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 I'm y'all and I'm ticking, but I'm letting you know. <laughs> that episode of Y'all Ticks available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up, though, in this program this morning, Congressman Philemon Vega resigned from his seat the other day representing South Texas. It complicates things for Democrats, and we're going to talk about that next on The Roundtable. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Abby Livingston is back with us, the D.C. Bureau Chief for the Texas Tribune. Bud Kennedy is here each week, a uh, columnist for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And so is Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer at WFAA in Dallas. But let's start with you. We're seeing the, the headlines about Attorney General Ken Paxton using state money to defend his law license. What is this about? Well, it's interesting. You know, he wants to make the case that that he uh, filed a lawsuit to, to overturn or challenge uh, the last presidential election. He was acting on behalf of the state of Texas, and that that's why the, the now his lost license is being challenged. You know, the other side of the coin is that the Texas Constitution doesn't require the attorney general to have an active law license. So is this something that's a state matter or a personal matter? Uh, if, his law, if his license is challenged, if he loses it, he'd still be attorney general. So, so that's, that is the question, Bernadine. Is this a personal matter or is it a state matter for the taxpayer money to be used on this? Well, one thing that the Constitution does as well is it dictates that you must represent elected officials in statewide uh, positions. So he's in, he can spend the money and he's going to spend the money or charge uh, the taxpayers, but he doesn't have to have a license. But hey, that one of the things that... that um, Bush is, uh, for George P is having to deal with is the fact that they're saying that his was not active. So I think that he does need the license, but it doesn't matter if he has it or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, of course, Paxton and George P. Bush are meeting in the uh, May 24th uh, yeah. Republican runoff there, too. I want to switch off, Abby, to you and, and talk about Philemon Vega, congressman, longtime congressman in South Texas. He said he wasn't going to run for re-election. Then he kind of shocked everyone and said he was going to resign. He did that Thursday night. Uh, what, what happens here? Does, does the governor call a special election or does he appoint someone to the office? The governor is most likely going to call a special election. And South Texas, which is where Congressman Vela is uh, based, is a former congressman, um, is the most competitive region in America in the U.S. House races in November. And this throws another complication down there. If a Republican wins the special election, Another congressman who is relocating to Congressman Vela's district could run against the Republican in this hypothetical, and we could actually have a member versus member race in South Texas in November. So get ready. Yeah, and to lay out why Vela is leaving, explain that one for us. Nothing happened here. He's just kind of moving on from Congress. 
Yeah, he was actually in consideration to be in the Biden cabinet, or at least rumored. And mm. uh, and that didn't happen because the House margins narrowed so much in November 2020 that the House didn't really have room to give for Democrats to leave. But he opted to leave anyway. And so he left. He's going to a lobbying and law firm. Uh, but there, there was no detectable malfeasance in his decision. And, and Bud, Abby just laid out the, the, uh, the criteria here for Democrats. How much does this complicate things down in the Valley? Well, you know, the Republicans might win a special election. We have these, uh, you know, essentially, I'm not going to say it's a nonpartisan special election, but it's an open election. Oh, everybody can run. Uh, you know, sometimes they do flip from one party to another, but then they flip back in the next general election cycle. You can conceivably have the Republicans picking up a moral victory, but then still not winning in November. Bernadine, we've talked about the Valley for quite a while now here, too. Uh, Republicans could be making inroads. Are Democrats in jeopardy there? Well, they are making inroads. If you look at the primary, they increased their margin of voters. Uh, while the uh, Democrats did increase slightly, the Republicans increased a lot. So uh, they put Democrats on notice. Now, whether or not they will win this special election, that's why the Republicans want this special election, so, th so that they can show the movement that the Republican Party has down in the South. But um, Democrats have been put on alert for many cycles. Yeah. So if they're not ready now, it's, it's on the Democrats because they should be ready to be more competitive by now. And Abby, you mentioned how th this will really be a showcased election. Are there any names yet that have been thrown out there as people who are going to run? Well, that's an interesting thing. There may be some Democrats who run in the special, but uh -huh. then they have got to not run in the two-year term because there's already a nominee and Congressman mm -hmm. Vicente gotcha. Gonzalez who neighbors. So I, I don't know names off the top of my head, but the Republican nominee, uh, Myra Flores, is running in the special. All right. Thanks so much, Abby. Appreciate it. Bud, Bernadine, thank you very much. Thank you for watching as well. We're back again next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics and hope you can join us soon. Take care.